Log Talk Radio. Welcome to the Spiritual Unity Radio Network, a station dedicated to the concept that all manifestations of the divine are equally valid. Join Reverend Terry Power HP, Robin McKean, and all the hosts for programming covering a wide range of spiritual topics right here on Blog Talk Radio. where we have the freedom to think about life without judgment. We take a look at society, we examine it, and we allow for the possibility of something new, something different. And now, here's your host, Alan Ritter. Welcome, everyone, to this Sunday night in May. It's actually the next to last Sunday, and I broadcast from the East Coast of the United States, so next week is Memorial Day weekend, a big uh, vacation, first vacation weekend, quote-unquote, in summer, lots of shore traffic in uh, my area. But uh, this is a very interesting time of the year. The seasons are finally shifting. Cold seems to finally be letting go its grasp. And I have the the honor to have on tonight uh, a local farmer who has a very interesting uh, uh, perspective, a very interesting niche that she's uh, trying to move into. So, uh, Hi, Amanda. This is Amanda Midkiff of Locust Light Farms, and how are you doing this evening? Hi, Alan. I'm doing very well. How are you? Good. I'm I'm doing very well. It's been a, a long, or it's actually the beginning of another busy week for me, and I'm I'm very uh, very pleased and uh, happy to be as busy as I am. Uh, even mm-hmm. though, I mean, I guess you get to the end of the day and if you hadn't done anything, you wouldn't be tired, and and you wouldn't be uh, you would you wouldn't have a big list for tomorrow. And I and I kind of was in that position in my life at one point, and uh, have you know it, that that's a point in your life, and you you have that point in your mm-hmm. life, and then you the wheel shifts, and uh, you you feel wow I have a I have a lot to do. There's already a lot on my list for tomorrow and for the week. So mm-hmm. um, as, a, as, as an introduction to uh, what, you're, uh, what you're bringing to manifestation and uh, sort of where you're at, uh, would you tell our listeners uh, how sort of your uh, uh, introductor, introductory story or, or where you came to be uh, doing what you're doing. Yeah. I have a small herb farm. It's really a large teaching garden now in Titusville, New Jersey, just south of Lambertville, New Jersey, very close to the Delaware River. Um, the garden is about a third of an acre, and I grow medicinal herbs, many varieties. I harvest the herbs and make herbal products, and I also teach herbalism classes that are focused in the garden. So um, when the weather, excuse me, is warm enough, we will harvest from the garden and then we make products and we learn about how to use them. We learn about body systems and herbal healing and people are able to take products home. It's very nice, I think. (laughs) I started Logos Light Farm 
three years ago, so this is my fourth season, um, and I started it on a different property across the river. And when I started Locust Light, I was planning on growing bulk herbs to sell, and I had an herbal CSA program, so I distributed a package of medicinal herbal products once a month to my members, um, and I enjoyed that. But as I went along, I realized that what I really wanted to do was have a garden that could be public where people could come and interact with the plants as living beings. And then I realized I needed to find a new spot to do that because the property I was on was beautiful, but it wasn't set up for public access. So I moved Locust Light to this new farm last year and I put a lot of the aspects of the business on hold while I got the perennial gardens established. And then this is my first season really starting up with classes and products again in this new space. So um, to backtrack and then go forward, so you <laughs> were in bulk herbs, and that's sort of uh, the scope of your business at that time. Yeah, that was my goal. I never ended up producing as many herbs as would have been necessary to do that. When I started the farm, I had started it in a very farm mindset because my background is in vegetable farming. And I saw myself primarily as a farmer. Um, and I wanted to just carry over those concepts to working with plants. But as I went on, I really had to take a different evaluation of myself and my skills and I realized something primarily that um, I'm, I get frustrated easily when I have to fix machinery. Um, I don't, I don't love working with machinery. Um, it's not my biggest skill. I get frustrated quickly. Um, and I realized, you know, if I was going to be really having a successful herbal farm on a large scale, I would need to be doing everything with machinery from harvesting a lot of different types of things with machinery to doing all the work. And um, I didn't want to be responsible for my own fleet of farm equipment. And I also realized I didn't want to interact with the plants that way. I didn't want to interact with the plants just in these long straight rows and, um, you know, harvesting them with a sidebar mower, say. Right. It was, uh, it was somehow, um, it was, it was not uh, a connection. I mean, it was basically, uh, I don't want to use a, a, a word, but it was, it was uh, too barbaric of a, um, of a, of a way to interact with, um, I mean, basically your perspective changed on how you, you, once you got into it, once you got uh, elbow deep into your practice, you you basically discovered that if you went forward with a with that uh, um, larger scale herbal farm, um, you were like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be harvesting this way, and and I can't do that. That's, yeah, that's sort of what and you discovered, right? And th and then you were like, well, oh my gosh, if I can't do that, I can't have that um, I can't have that farm the way I had envisioned it. Right. And I do think there is a place for farms that are grow like farms um, that in this country are growing herbs using sustainable practices, but also equipment, because I think the demand for organic um, local bulk herbs is high, and you can only really meet that um, by growing on a larger scale. Um, but I just realized. I think there's an aspect when you run a small business, so on the one hand, you have to plan your own strengths. And on the other hand, life as a small farmer is so difficult in so many ways that you need to make it enjoyable. And so both of those things, but then again, what make, what, when you're doing what's enjoyable for you, the business is going to be most successful. So it was almost hard for me to step away from thinking of myself mostly as a farmer. Like I had never... I'm not someone who came to farming via gardening and I had never had a garden and I had no interest in having a garden. Uh, so it's been hard for me to shift this identity um, as like having a larger scale farm and like really just thinking of the plants as crops 
um, in a loving way, not necessarily a commodifying way, um, but having that type of relationship, it's been, and, you know, it took a, it's taken a lot of smaller steps for me to get to a point where I realize, you know, what I have now is a large teaching garden and it's very productive. And with herbs, you get, you know, you grow a lot in a small space and get a lot of plants out of a small space. And um, so I am harvesting from it and drying the plants. And then I'm storing dried herbs and people are harvesting from the garden too. Um, So it wasn't, it wasn't an easy shift, but it definitely feels like the right shift for me. Yeah, it takes a um, it takes a special kind of uh, uh, I would call it guts to basically say, well, gee, this isn't working for me, um, mm-hmm. and I know four years from now if I get further into this, but it takes that vision. It takes that vision of looking forward and saying, okay, where is this going, and right. then being able right. then being able to say, okay. Um, I really can't do that. And most people get into it and say, well, I don't really have an alternative. And they, they go four years down the road and then they're really stuck because mm-hmm. they're, they're further down the road and they're basically saying, well, gee, I built myself a practice. I've got a clientele and they're, they're uh, throwing money at me. I'm successful, but I hate it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And you've invested so much in it at that point. So um, why don't you uh, walk us through uh, some of uh, what you do? Um, we were talking yesterday about uh, some of the practices and some of the um, things that you offer. And uh, let's start talking about uh, using herbs and ritual and, and how um, that came about and what you do in that area. Yeah. I I love ritual and I believe very strongly that meaningful ritual can support a meaningful life. And I think that in our society we have grown up and perpetuated a lot of meaningless ritual and meaningless ceremony and I think that that's very damaging and has turned people away from the concept of ritual. And I was raised you know, in a very, like, in a very religious home where there was a lot of ritual that I didn't feel was meaningful. Um, And as I entered in, as I was going into adulthood, I began to realize that I really missed ritual, though. I missed any type of ritual, um, but I wanted the rituals in my life to be meaningful. And so I slowly started working with crafting my own rituals and... This developed along with a lot of other spiritual training I was going through, like learning yoga philosophy, practicing Reiki, studying shamanism, and also studying herbalism. And I began incorporating herbs into rituals for myself, and I found it to be extremely powerful. Um, And so that's something that's just naturally developed for me. Um, I like working with the elements quite a bit, and I think that's usually where I start when I'm working with herbs. So, um, you know, working with herbs in water is a very common way because it's very easy to make an infusion that you can consume. I really enjoy taking herbal baths or pouring herbs over my head. Um, You know, working with herbs and air, is really nice, um, like smoking herbs or burning them. And that's also, of course, connecting herbs with fire um, and burying herbs into the ground. Working with herbs and earth is nice too. So part of my mission in the world, I feel, is to help bring meaningful ritual into people's lives. And I like making herbal products that people can use for that. Um, Of course, anyone can easily make their own ritual products with herbs. It's really quite simple but I think a lot of people that can feel like quite a leap. So I like providing items to people that they can use. Um, one of the things I m- make and sell most of is herbal smoking blends that are one of which is designed specifically for ceremonial or ritual use. Um, and the other, of which is designed to be very calming or relaxing. Um, but they are both very meditative blends. And I also 
seasonally make a variety of smudge sticks. Um, I have smudge stick making workshops and I just, I think that that's a really wonderful way to incorporate herbs into any ritual. So as far as um, these uh, smoking blends that you're talking about, um, what are uh, like a, what is like a, a one blends uh, ingredient list? Well, one of my blends is called Transport, and that's the blend that's for ceremonial purposes. All my blends start out with a base of marshmallow, leaf, and mullein leaf, uh, because those herbs are very supportive to the lungs and to the mucous membranes. So I like to give a little mucous membrane support because, you know, you don't have to smoke a smoking blend to get the spiritual or even flavor benefits of it. I don't usually inhale them, um, but some people do when they like that. Um, and your mucous membranes don't enjoy inhaling smoke, but if you don't do it too much, it's not that damaging um, if you have healthy mucous membranes. So I start with a foundation of marshmallow leaf and mullein. And then in the transport, I include motherwort. Uh, which is a native plant that is used medicinally for evening out fluctuations, whether it's hormonal fluctuations or fluctuations of the heart and the heart rhythm. Um, but energetically, it's used for astral travel and astral projectioning. So it's an extremely, extremely expansive herb energetically. I also use Japanese mugwort in that blend. Um, Artemisias in general are very connected with the moon and mugwort is a plant that's used to help you to get into a deeper trance state or meditative state. It's also used for lucid dreaming, so it's very mind-opening. Uh, and I use Japanese mugwort, which is the type of mugwort that's used in acupuncture. Um, so it's an extremely very medicinal plant. I use Mexican tarragon in that blend, uh, which is an herb used by Southwestern Native peoples for ceremony. And then I also add spearmint in that blend, and that is mostly for flavor. Um, it really, the strongest flavor notes in that blend are the Mexican tarragon and the spearmint. The spearmint brings them all together. And there's a small, small amount of catnip in that blend, which is very relaxing. Um, and I feel like catnip, in my experience, catnip relaxes in a slightly hypnotic way, almost like hops does, but much more mild. So I think it's, I think that when you are easing yourself into a ritual experience or trying to or setting the stage for a transportive or a meditative experience, being able to relax into the moment is a big part of that. So I add just a touch of catnip in there. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, the, the other thing that you'd mentioned is uh, smudge sticks. And mm -hmm. I've used uh, smudge and I, I do uh, uh, house clearing and, and, uh, and smudging myself. And mm -hmm. uh, so besides uh, sage, uh, what do you include in your smudge sticks? I make a lot of different combinations of smudge sticks because once I get started, I want to make every type of combination. Um, I do grow white sage, not enough to sell. So sometimes I'll put a little bit of white sage in a smudge stick. I grow a type of artemisia called western mugwort, which is also a desert plant that grows in our New Jersey climate more easily than white sage. Um, so it is a little bit oily. It's that beautiful silver color and it is used for energetic clearing. And that is a self-seeding annual here. So it's not a perennial plant, but it self-sows and comes back easily every year, which is very nice. I also use lavender. I use different types of mints. I do make a smudge stick that is the same ingredients as the transport smoking blend. So it's a transport smudge stick. I make a smudge stick that is designed to be uplifting. So that stick also involves and includes lemon balm and pennyroyal, which are both very uplifting herbs. Um, I make a stick called Sanctify, which has the Western mugwort. It has sweet annie in it and a very small bit of white sage and usually a little bit of mugwort. Yeah, most, you know, a lot of herbs in the mint family, which is quite large, are safe for burning or smoking. Um, mm -hmm. So I like to include those herbs and also in the Artemisia family, which is also quite large. 
Yeah, it's fun. It's fun when you are when you are able to pick a lot of different types of herbs and just lay them out and go for it. You know, make so many different types of blends all at once. Those are it's really fun to do. And it's nice to make sticks with intentions too. So whether the intention is, oh, I, you know, I think that this stick can be used for this type of energy work, or if you're making a stick personally for yourself um, or for someone that you know, I think that's really special too. I also, be, last winter, began working a lot with burning rosemary, kind of by accident. I think I was, I was in my house and I was sitting down and I had some dried rosemary on my table and I maybe also had a candle lit and I started burning the rosemary and really fell in love with the fragrance of the rosemary and the energy of the rosemary. And so I work with rosemary a lot now in the winter. So um, one of the things that I had always thought about is um, the, certainly there's a product being prepared, but do you ever, um, prepare yourself and then uh, sort of uh, you sort of set your table you're sort of the chef and you set the table you've got these herbs laid out you're going to make um, a recipe Um, but Mm -hmm. then do you prepare yourself and go into it with an intention and go into it maybe um, maybe in an atmosphere, maybe you smudge the room or maybe there's something uh, else going on. So is that actually for you um, a ritual? It is, and it's a surprisingly difficult one. I have, I have very, a very strong rule for myself about not preparing food for people when I'm stressed or feeling frantic. Um, the strongest moment of this in my life was when I was and I was preparing almost all of the food for my sister's bridal shower, which was, I think it was a Sunday. And the night before, which was the time that I was going to be preparing this food, I was extremely upset about something. I don't remember what, but I was extremely upset. And I just knew that I wasn't going to make the food when I was feeling that way. And when my heart was feeling so sad or however it was feeling Um, because I do believe that your energy flows into anything that you make that you give to someone else, especially something that you consume. Um, So in that case, I I just waited and I got up earlier the next morning and prepared everything. Um, It's hard for me when I make products because um, I have, I make the products in a, commercial kitchen that I share with other businesses. My farm is located on a property where there is also an organic vegetable farm and a farm to table Mm -hmm. cooking school. And so there's a common building where a farmer's market happens. The school has classes and dinners and there's a lot of events and a lot of people use the space. So I can only use the space on Mondays to make products, which is fine. I don't need it more than that. Um, but I can get a little frantic and chaotic on those days because I need to bring everything set up the space and then hopefully get everything done and cleaned up well um, by the end of the day. And there's definitely moments when I'll feel myself getting frantic and then I really need to pause and take deep breaths because it really does matter to me that I don't put any sort of frantic energy into the products and that I need to be peaceful and be thinking about the goodness of the products and my belief in what I'm doing when I'm making them. I even have, I make self-care facial mists and so I'll often mist myself (laughs) when I'm doing that just to keep (laughs) my energy in check and not let myself get too frantic. So as far as, um, so we've covered the smoking blends and the smudge sticks. Um, mm-hmm. What other um, what other products or what other areas of uh, ritual uh, do you uh, do you have uh, intention in or products in or things that I'm I, I don't know about? 
something that I'm starting to do and want to develop is making herbal bath kits um, for ritual use, not just like the types of bath balms or bath salts that are popular now, um, but a mix of herbs for an infusion to add to your bath and something that involves, you know, a fragrance and a type of maybe salt or clay. Um, because I think that bathing with herbs it can be a very, very, very powerful ritual, whether it's a full body bath or just a foot bath, because not all people have a bathtub or light baths. That's something that I enjoy and have been developing. Um, I also, as I said, make these like self-care products that are portable and they have essential oils for aroma in them, but the real magic is flower essences. And I think that mostly I sell roll-ons and facial mists and they have these flower essences in them. And Mm -hmm. they're a nice way to create space for yourself during your day. So really they're a tool to take a moment out of your day um, when you're out in the world and take a moment to yourself and reset. Because I think that that type of moment-to-moment self-care is very important, whether it's in the workplace or you got a family gathering that's stressful or you have to go make a big purchase and that's stressful, you know. We're often having to be out in the world in ways that can, you know, make us forget in the moment, like, what the true reality is. And, you know, most of us have to go and interact with the mundane world for most of our day. Um, so I think it can be helpful to remember the magic and remember our truth, even when we're out and about. Right. To basically have a uh, sort of an escape switch that you can, right. uh, uh, basically just sort of, uh, uh, turn, turn to a corner of the room with your head and see, to be able to isolate from visual, visually uh, meeting eyes with other people or mm-hmm. um, st- you know, step into a space like that where it's private even for 30 seconds and mm-hmm. um, basically uh, ground yourself with this, uh, with this roll-on or this spray so that mm-hmm. – and then just may- may- maybe say uh, – maybe say a little prepared uh, mantra or, or something like that so that you uh, just basically transport yourself for even for those 15 seconds back to, um, gee, I'm, I'm just out here in the world. Um, my foundation is, is, um, is, is, is still solid and I'm out mm-hmm. here um, manifesting other things that help me keep uh, my practice intact. So this is actually out. I'm out here. It's part of my practice. Um, Mm -hmm. But just to to bring yourself back into your practice um, uh, in a, in a, in a, um, it it, it basically can make a connection to where you were that weekend before where you were three months ago when you were with your teacher or, or something like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think this is a good time to take the break, everyone. And I'm going to play a song by uh, Dave the Bard called How and Toe. We'll be back in about four and a half minutes. See you then, everyone.
Pagan Radio. You can hear your favorite artists such as Dave the Bard, Tawatha Dea, Spiral Rhythm, S.J. Tucker, Murphy's Midnight Rounders, and many, many more. Join us for exciting shows like Ask a Witch and Storytime with Rook as well. www.internationalpaganradio.com on the net or on TuneIn Radio on your mobile devices. Join us on Facebook and Twitter too. International Pagan Radio, all pagan, all the time. Welcome back to an emerging forest on the Spiritual Unity Radio Network. We hope everyone was able to stretch their legs and get a drink. And now, back to Alan. Welcome back, everyone, and welcome back to our guest, Amanda. So, Amanda, we've talked about your uh, ritual uh, uh, products and some of the uh, many rituals that, I mean, you don't have to use the the smoking blend in someone else's ritual. You can use it in your own idiosyncratic personal ritual. Mm -hmm, Uh, But you like to, you you like to host... um, and sort of uh, do hands-on, and since you're in a uh, teaching garden, you have uh, the ability to host uh, a few people or more than a few people. Um, So you actually host um, retreats or uh, teaching of ritual. Um, So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I host seasonal circles. Um, So I host rituals for each of the eight seasonal holidays, the quarter and cross quarter holidays. So that would be the solar holidays of the equinoxes and the solstices, and then the fire celebrations of Lamas, Samhain, Involk, and um, well, Wow, I don't know. I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting the other one. Beltane. Wow, Beltane, the one that just happened. Um, so, I host these along with a close friend of mine, and we used to farm together. And then we 
um, began to study shamanism together. And then we just started hosting seasonal circles for our close friend group. And then when I moved to this new spa, I decided that it would be very nice to open this up to the public. Um, And I feel like it's very important because I live a very seasonal lifestyle and I'm like, my whole being is just very in tune with the moving of nature where I live. And so I feel my energy become beginning to become more solar and spiral outward as the days increase. And I feel my energy begin to spiral inward and become more lunar and become more yin um, as the days shorten. And, you know, the, the idea of seasonality is not just a nice concept to me. It's, it's the way my body works and the way I am as a being. Um, so I really enjoy acknowledging that very mindfully and with a lot of reflection and intention setting and preparation and meaningful activity. Um, and I really enjoy creating space for other people to do that too, because I feel like that is something that people really crave um, and people really appreciate gathering around that. Um, I, but I think people don't always know how to make that space for themselves. So I enjoy being the person to create the space for that type of gathering to happen. Yeah, it's very important. Uh, certainly people, people want to be, people want to be at the party and Mm -hmm. they just, they just don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And it, it, um, for, for people who pathfind into, um, into endeavors, uh, maybe they have a teacher or maybe they just go into the area and make, um, make all the mistakes themselves and they look at themselves and they say, well, why am I making all these mistakes? And now that you understand why you made all the mistakes because now you're able to hold the space for other people, but you look at yourself and, mm-hmm. and you look at your consciousness and you say, well, why am I a pathfinder? And and you know why am I the uh, the why am I the dandelion uh, breaking the ground or something like that mm-hmm. where other people just aren't and you just have to um, sometimes sometime in your private space you sort of you sort of look in the mirror and 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 with a with this raised eyebrow or this quizzical look on your face because you're saying why why am I built this way because I don't see very many other people who are or something like that. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, I like what, working with what, mm-hmm. Go ahead. I was going to I was going to add to that and say that I like working with archetypes a lot, even not if it's not a specific set of archetypes, but just I create archetypes in my head and I think it can be very helpful um because, you know, there are so many things that one can do in the world. Um, and there might even be so many things that a person wants to do or likes to do. And I, I'm someone who can be pulled in a lot of different directions. Um, and like I was talking to you about my decision-making process with changing the nature of my business and really realizing I had to focus on what my actual skills were because that's also what I enjoy, even though I enjoyed the feeling of, being a farmer and farming a larger portion of land and bringing in these huge bountiful harvests. Um, But I've done a lot of thinking about who I truly am as a person in the world and what my role in the world or my village is. And I, I really feel that I'm a weaver and a storyteller and those are the things I'm best at. And those are the things that bring me the most joy is when I'm able to like, weave community, help people connect, help people connect with themselves, hear people's stories, help people to tell their own stories, help people to make sense of their own narratives, share their narratives, become empowered by their narratives, help tell the stories of the plants, be, you know, be the voice through which the plants tell their stories to the people. Um, And sometimes when I'm feeling lost among the options or I need to focus in, I think 
what can I do that is helping me be true to that role because I know that that is my role. And as much as there are other things that I might want to do, for me that role of being the weaver and the storyteller is I know that's truest to my nature and I feel very comfortable in that role. Sort of speaking maybe for the plants, reminding mm-hmm. the um, reminding the disconnected society of of their roles in their life, and yeah. introducing and introducing um, not to the graduate, but you don't have graduates, which is why you have the teaching garden. Um, you're mm-hmm. introducing to to the class of uh, initiates or neophytes um, mm-hmm. these ways these ways that they can take um, their beginning classes in uh, a reawakening their consciousness and their connection to nature. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm very happy to be someone who shows people how to make a more medicinally potent cup of tea or who shows people that you can take this herb, chew it up and put it on your skin, like very basic level. But I think moving past that, like just entering into that basic space of interaction with plants, that alone is so empowering. And that is what really opens up the doors of the imagination to think, oh, if I can do this, can I do this? You know, and just adding another tool to the toolbox. Right. I mean, so basically you're going, um, I don't want to call anything mundane, but you're going from a um, an everyday uh, uh, chew it and then apply it topically um, to more of a, uh, a setting in which there's a deeper there's a there's a cultivated uh respect for uh, many levels in the in the ritual and then one uh recursively brings that back to the mundane topical application because you don't forget what happened in the ritual so that right. uh brings together the entire practice of that one particular individual and um, to uh, to say another catchphrase, sort of raises the level of their game, mm-hmm. where yeah. they connect. They don't. They don't say, "Oh, this is disconnected from the ritual." They say, "Oh, everything in my life is cohesively part of respecting my connection to nature," um, mm-hmm. and every time I I continue to cultivate my consciousness about um, about my connection, I bring additional pieces of my life into uh, a higher level of respect. Mm-hmm. And, and the, I mean, yeah. the end game is basically, the end game is basically um, uh, complete respect for oneself and then complete mm-hmm. respect because, because not, because nothing is outside of your complete respect. Um, right. You like yourself. <laughs> you, yeah. You're like, Oh my gosh, I really like myself. And mm-hmm. yeah, that's, um, that's a, that's a very, uh, very powerful, uh, a very powerful journey to go on. Yeah. So you host um, eight of these gatherings each year. Is that correct? It is, though the first one that was open to the public was spring equinox. So I haven't gone through a full yearly cycle yet. Um, So the next one will be uh, summer solstice and then llamas after that. Summer solstice will be approximately the June 20, early, either the 20 or the early 20s, right? Yeah, I think 
Uh, it's scheduled for Tuesday, the 21st. Right. So that's 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 sort of that sort of encapsulates um, part of what you do. And uh, now we're sort of going to shift gears and um, get into an area um, that you're uh, sort of calling personal resilience or using herbs in personal resilience and. After mm-hmm. our little chat yesterday, I, I I sort of thought about it, and it's um, more uh, classical um, classical herbalism. Is that what you is that how you would look at it? Yeah, I think that's been a good way to put it. So some people say what you want to you want to describe um, what you offer in in classical herbalism. Yeah, so I teach hands-on classes about using herbs for personal wellness. So the classes are structured different ways. Sometimes they're focused around a specific technique. So the class might be all about tinctures and what tinctures are, um, how to use them, how to dose a tincture, um, different ways of making tinctures, and then we everyone makes a tincture to take home. Or the class might be themed um, about specific herbs. So, for instance, on Wednesday, I'm teaching a class called Springtime Tonic Herbs. So that's a class about herbs that are growing right now in the springtime, and we're going to be honing in on certain herbs. So that class will start in the garden, and in the garden we'll visit and harvest nettle, plantain, yellow dock, and cleavers. So we'll see them growing, we'll experience them in the garden, we'll harvest the plants, and then we'll bring them inside, and we'll make an infusion and taste the plants. And then we will all make, I think we're making a tincture for this class, so we'll make a tincture to take home also. So that's a class that's, you know, mostly focused on the herbs. And then in June, I'm starting a series called Practical Herbalism, And that series is going to be based around um, health situations for which you would use herbs and also herbal preparations. So in each class, we're going to learn about one type of preparation, whether it be an infusion, a tincture, an oil, a liniment, et cetera. Um, And then also a health topic. So one is going to be herbs for first aid. One is going to be digestion reproductive health, stress and anxiety, et cetera. So over the course of a certain number of months, you're going to uh, like step through uh, a set number of, I mean, there's a set number of uh, preparation methods for herbs, but you're going to step Mm -hmm. through uh, a, a set, okay, you can make a tincture, you, you can make uh, an infusion, you can make a liniment, you can make a poultice, mm-hmm. um, a few mm-hmm. other things, and you're going to basically step through um, what, to, what to use for um, each body system, uh, basically uh, treatment of uh, various ailments. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. And the focus for me is always on herbs that are growing in the garden for a few reasons. One is that they're local herbs, um, and so I know that people can get them. The other is that there are really an unlimited amount of herbs in this world, and I think it's helpful to have some parameter, and so my parameter is always um, what herbs I'm growing. And then the other reason is that those are the herbs I have the closest relationship with and know the best and feel most comfortable teaching. Um, you know, I hope, you know, as I continue in my journey, I will continue getting to know plants well, but I have, in the time I've had Locust Light, I really have focused my herbal learning on the herbs that I'm able to grow because I can experience them the most dynamically. Well, it's also, um, as you said, it's, 
it's what is available is literally, it's not a mistake. I mean, what's available mm-hmm. at the time when there's the issue is mm-hmm. um, Mother Nature provides you the issue, but Mother Nature also might provide you um, something outside of your back step, which would um, be uh, alleviating for that issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, you offer these, um, these are, are these are pretty frequent classes, or how, how frequent do they happen? I, my classes tend to be, I tend to offer two to three a week. And now that the weather is warmer, I also have weekend programming in the garden. So in, on the weekends, my garden is open for medicinal pick your own. So people can come and pick the herbs and there is myself or a staff member there who can guide people in what's available to harvest, how to pick it, and some basic ways to use it. And then I also have a meditation in the garden. I have garden tours and I have specific classes in the garden um, where we're not also using an indoor space for the class. So the one of those is say something that I was going to have on Saturday, which I had to reschedule was a smudge stick making workshop where we could all sit and make smudge sticks together for the new moon. Um, Something that's coming up next weekend is a series that I'm doing on plant energetics. So working with the energetics of the different parts of the plant and we're starting with leaves. So everything we could talk about from the perspective of just working with leaves from how to harvest leaves and how to dry leaves and how to work with leaves and how to prepare leaves from what is the energy of working with leaves? Um, how are, you know, how are leaves working in our body Etc. And then as the season goes, we'll move to, in June, there'll be a working with flowers workshop, and then there'll be a working with fruit, working with seeds, and then working with roots in the fall. That's really interesting because basically you're working with uh, obviously all parts of the plant, and mm-hmm. but it's also it's also seasonal because you're working with um, as the season changes, the offerings of that particular plant change, and you're mm-hmm. using it, uh, as you just said, um, from uh, from spring, new new leaf, through uh, fall fruit, and then um, winter or uh, cooler season root, right? Right. Right. And so and some plants you can um, use. Go ahead. Some plants you are using all of the parts. Some plants, say German chamomile, for instance, we're really just using the flower and then the plant will fade away and we're not digging up the root. But there are some plants where you are using different parts of the plant through the cycle of the year, like nettle, for instance. We use nettle leaves mostly, but you can also use nettle seed and nettle root. That's interesting. So the chamomile, as you just uh, mentioned, is sort of um, only one part is useful or only one part seems useful or only one part is commonly useful, whereas right. the nettle whereas the nettle has a multi-seasonal, uh, multi-part um, Use, usable um, usable offering. That's um, mm-hmm. that's interesting. Yeah. So you basically uh, become acquainted with sort of a, a, a toolbox of local herbs, uh, and mm-hmm. have you, do you uh, have do you have any notable? Um, uh, items that you've imported that are not native? Did I grow? Yes. You mean? Yeah, definitely. Yes. Well, okay, when I think about when I think about an herb garden, there are different reasons to grow plants. 
And some gardens focus on just one of the reasons, but my garden focuses on a number of them. So one reason to grow plants is simply because, say take, say take nettle, for instance. Nettle is a plant that it's not native, but it's, local, it's um, naturalized, and it grows wild. But as someone, like I, I live in an apartment, and I have access to a beautiful piece of farmland, um, but I don't live on a 10-acre property with lots of wild spaces. So for me, if I wanted to forage nettle, you know, it's very difficult to find a place that I know is safe that's not being sprayed, that's not being sprayed for mosquitoes or peed on by dogs or very polluted. Um, so it's really nice for me to be able to grow nettle and offer to the public a place where they can harvest nettle that they know is clean. Um, you know, and also it's growing in soil that, you know, I'm, I'm pretty aware that nothing has spilled there, you know, that might be toxic in the past 14 years, um, mm -hmm. which we can't guarantee for a wild place. You know, someone could dump something anywhere. So, um, so that's a reason, say, for a number of herbs. Simply, it's just, it's just easier, and you, more herbs are more accessible if you grow them, and they're all in one place, and you know, know the place is safe. Another reason is to grow native plants that are endangered or over-harvested in the wild, that's great. I grow some of those, and I'm working on incorporating more as I learn more about them. And then another reason, which I feel fine about, is that there are some herbs that are very useful to us humans that are not native. And if we are going to buy them, we might be importing them from other countries, which could be problematic because we might not know that they are, in fact, that herb. Even if we know that that herb, we might not be aware of the quality or, you know, what conditions were they really being grown under, what conditions, mm -hmm. you know, how, what were the lives like of the people who were harvesting the plants, were they treated fairly, um, or even, you know, is that herb being over harvested in the wild in a different country, and we don't, we can't know those things. So, you know, I think maybe in a different type of world, um, it would be neat if we were able, if we just chose to just focus on native plants that really grow here. Um, but I also take a, like a practical stance that says ashwagandha is an Indian herb that is so helpful for humans and it's so helpful for Americans right now. Um, it's not going to become invasive in this country. And I feel that ashwagandha that has grown and experienced life in New Jersey or Pennsylvania is going to be more on a more similar vibration to someone who lives in the mid Atlantic. And thus is going to be more, the medicine of that plant is going to be more helpful to a person who takes that. And I feel okay about growing that. Um, I think there are one of one mission with any type of farming, whether it's vegetables or herbs, I think is to simply provide people with more responsible gentle to the earth consumption alternatives. And so in some cases, if it's a plant that people are going to be getting anyway, I'd rather provide them a more responsible option. So, you know, I'd rather try to grow an amount of white sage myself. And that way, if someone's getting white sage from me, you know, we know we're not taking away from wild desert stands of white sage and we can all feel okay about that. Um, even though that plant isn't native. And so I do take that practical mindset with my garden and what I grow. So, yeah, I would say ashwagandha is a very strong example of that. Tulsi, holy basil, is a really strong example of that. Um, a lot of the herbs in my garden are herbs that were not native to this country but were brought over with Europeans. So they've been here, you know, as long as Europeans have been. But... um so we don't really think about them as being foreign, but they are like calendula, valerian, um, stinging nettle, any of those plants. Um, I'm trying to think of other things that I grow that are definitely Indian herbs. I would like to grow shatavari. Um, I haven't succeeded at that yet. I grow, I grow astragalus. Um, I grow licorice. 
you know, these are all herbs that we're used to using, but they're not native. They're Asian herbs. Mm-hmm. You know. That's, uh, that's uh, quite a list. So mm-hmm. uh, not to put you on the spot or anything, but, of course, to put you on the mm-hmm. spot. Um, <sighs> maybe seasonally, uh, we can certainly do seasonally. It's uh, the 20th of May. But what is growing right now in your teaching garden that um, is your uh, favorite um, herb for this date? Just uh, a, a real all-around performer, or something, or just uh, oh. just your favorite uh, for some reason. <laughs> Well, I have to say, this really is the time of the year when nettle is a shining star, and nettle's always a shining star in my life. So this is definitely the nettle time of year. And the nettle's so happy right now. It's so it's such a beautiful dark green, and it's really come into its own already, where a lot of the other plants are still getting started, especially with this very slow spring. Um, all the plants are slow to awaken and grow. But the nettle's thriving. Yeah. I will say, though, I, also, uh, my, my rose bush just started blooming a few days ago. And that's very, that always makes me very happy. I have three bushes, and one of them has moved with me. It's moved three times, and each time I thought it's died, and it has not died, it's survived. And then I have two younger bushes, and one of them is just blooming for the first time. So... I believe we've covered the the areas that uh, we had set out to cover. Is there anything um, that you would like to add at this time? Hmm. Well, I think I'd like to add that I feel like any time a person, any time a person is the least bit empowered in their own wellness, whether it's as small as they're feeling nauseous, so they eat a peppermint candy, or they're feeling nauseous, so they drink some ginger, or, you know, they have a homemade first aid salve, or they're outside and realize they can chew up plantain and put it on their skin. Any small act of that, I feel like, is extremely empowering and is its own form of resistance and subversion and resilience because it's putting our power for our own health back in our own hands. And I think that makes each of us stronger as people and it makes our community stronger. I, I completely agree. So um, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, where can people find you? And uh, tell us where you're located again. I'm located in Titusville, New Jersey, on the western edge of New Jersey. It's right on the Delaware River, kind of central Jersey all the way to the river. It's just south of Lambertville, which is a pretty common tourist destination. Um, People can go to my website, which is locustlightfarm.com. That's locust light as in the tree the black locust tree um and i'm also on instagram as locust light farm and on facebook so in general uh people would get to you by um getting on 95 uh from pennsylvania crossing the scudders fall bridge um, getting mm-hmm. off of Route 29 and going a little yes. bit north. Yes, and the if farm you get to the just... antiques, if you get to the antiques market, you've gone too far. Exactly. Yeah, the farm is on Pleasant Valley Road, which is a road that intersects Route 29. So if you're on Route 29, the farm is very easy to find from there. Yeah, and it's very um, close to the Golden Nugget. You, you, you can, tell, you can tell by my you can tell by my description that I'm. Uh, somewhat familiar with the area. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Are you a Golden Nugget shopper? I I well I've used the Golden Nuggets before and I and I uh have uh friends in in Morrisville and I worked in Princeton for nine years. So I've I've been mm-hmm. in that area for 
I, I haven't been in that area. I'm not presently located in that area. I'm presently across uh-huh. the river from Philadelphia, which is uh, sort of okay. my uh, my my herbal practice is uh, making use of the uh, the wholesale market uh, at the Philadelphia Regional Produce Center to get people to mm-hmm. eat more plants. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So so everyone. Uh, As always, my name is Alan Ritter, and this has been another awesome episode of An Emerging Forest. And I have a small produce business in the southeastern Pennsylvania and southern New Jersey area, and I want to get people to eat more plants. So people go into the grocery Mm -hmm. store, and they're like, oh, these are way too expensive. Well, just across the river in the thing in the megalopolis that we call the Port of Philadelphia there's a huge fire hose of, of much cheaper produce, even <laughs> at the number one or commensurate value to what you get at the Whole Foods or what you get at your Wegmans. Um, sometimes it's a factor of two less. Sometimes it's a factor of three less. Well, and that's for the same quality level. That's for number one. So at the end of the day, they sell 95% or 98% of that to grocery stores, but they're left with a small amount. Well, a small amount to them is, a, is three or four pallets, and that's hundreds of cases mm-hmm. of produce. And they discount that even further. And then they sell most of that, but there's like 40 or 50 cases of sweet potato that becomes basically a nuisance to them. And they discount that down to five bucks a case for organics. Wow. Basically what they're saying is, hey, hey, folks, some free food, come take it. So that's kind of what I do. That's the business that I'm in, trying to get the word out that there's lots of free food for all those people that are that are um, not being able to make ends meet. And so you can find me at produceclub.us, and you can you can also find me at my email address r i t t e r period a l a n eighty eight at gmail dot com. And it's definitely worth a 45-minute or an hour drive one way to come down or just send me an email, and I'll send you the price list every week, and you can look at it and just start growing your awareness of of what's available to eat for cheap. Thank you to my my wonderful guest, Amanda. Thanks so much, Amanda. Thanks so much, Alan. I had a great time. And... We'll talk off air, but I'd like to do specific programs or a specific program on like two herbs and basically just go through them mm. or or two yeah, or, that'd or be amazing. Expand. I mean basically we did we did like an overview. Let's do mm-hmm. um possibly, you know, another another rainy day, another rainy season type thing where we <laughs> just say, Hey, let's let's add on to the portfolio where we really talk in depth about specific areas. Um, yeah. Thank you again for, uh, for being on the program and have a wonderful week and I'll be talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. You have a good week too. All right. for listening to the Spiritual Unity Radio Network. Join us seven nights a week for exciting programming covering a variety of expressions of faith. And remember, all manifestations of the divine are equally valid. Mm-hmm.